So when we talk about inflammation, and really we're talking about acute inflammation, meaning that it's happening within minutes to hours to days, uh, we, it's a good place to start with the cardinal signs of inflammation. These are uh, well-established signs that date back to uh, ancient times. So let's go through each of these. We've got heat, redness, swelling, pain, and loss of function. So the first one is heat or calor. And this is going to be a literal increase in temperature. That makes sense, right? And this is due to increased blood flow to a region. Now it's kind of gross, but I want you guys to think about when we go through these um, these signs of something like a pimple or uh, you know if you've got a little area of inflammation that's kind of what I want you to think about so I've got increased blood flow to that site of injury that term is hyperemia this is going to result in warm blood to the area that you can touch it's going to feel hot the second one is redness or rubor and this is going to appear grossly red so again if you go back to that idea of an abscess or a pimple, it might be red, it might be hot to the touch. And this is again due to increased blood flow to that area, okay? We need blood flow to that area to bring all the good stuff to help fight that infection or that cause of injury. Swelling is the middle guy here, okay? And this is two more uh, where we get the word tumor, like in cancer. It is a mass effect. It is a physical swelling in this case. Okay, so it's gonna appear grossly swollen. And this is due to edema. So I'm gonna get an accumulation of fluid outside of the vessel, the extravascular space, into that area of injury. Now, with fluid, I'm also hopefully going to get inflammatory cells, so leukocytes, white blood cells. The cells that are gonna help fight that uh, area of injury, I want them to get to that area as well. And both of those are going to impart a swelling that we can see. So when I say edema, that, that phrase just means exudation of fluid or plasma protein out of the blood vessel into that site of injury. Pain or dolor, this is a physical stretching of that area. And that's again due to the edema. I've got an increase in cells, increased number of cells that's going to uh, impart stretching. And it's a bit of a complex process, uh, but one of the the big mediators that I think about are prostaglandins, okay? So I'm, I'm jumping ahead to subsequent lectures, but uh, prostaglandins are a really good target when we talk about non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, NSAIDs. So if I take a leave or Advil, um, we've got different NSAIDs for horses and cats and dogs, that's what we're targeting. And so when we take those NSAIDs, we oftentimes see a, a reduction in pain because we're blocking that. Now the last one is um, not Celsius, our, our ancient times guy, but rather Vercal, this guy up in the corner. Uh, he's the father of modern pathology, so I had to include him. Um, but he came up with this loss of function. So if I think about if I hit my thumb with a hammer, it may physically swell so much so that I can't physically bend it. And so that's where that loss of function comes in. Pain also plays a role in that. So we talked about the, the five cardinal signs of inflammation. Now let's jump to the five R's of inflammation. Not to be confused with the five D's of dodgeball, that's something totally different, okay? So five R's of inflammation broadly are, we first need to recognize the injurious agent. If we don't recognize it, how are we gonna fight it, okay? We then wanna recruit leukocytes or recruit those white blood cells to the site of injury so they can do their job. That job typically is removing the agent. If it's a bacteria, if it's a splinter in my skin, I need to get rid of it. Importantly, we have to regulate the response. So if we think about kind of a checks and balances system, I want all systems go when I first get that inflammation to fight it, fight the bacteria, fight whatever injury it is. But at some point I need to tamp that down and start uh, favoring resolution or repair, which is our last one. So let's dive into a couple of these today. I really like this diagram because it's a nice broad overview of each of those five R's. And I do wanna point out up top here that the injurious agent could be a microbe, in this case a bacteria, but it also might just be directly damaged tissue, necrotic tissue or dead tissue. So that could be a burn, like a sunburn. That's gonna cause an injury that is then gonna tell cells 
hey, we need to react. So I've got a variety of sentinel cells that recognize either injury or pathogens like bacteria, viruses. And I think of them as kind of sitting up in their watchtower surveying the land, okay? If they see smoke from a fire, they need to tell someone, hey, I need all systems go, we gotta fight that, okay? So my big sentinel cells here, mast cells, dendritic cells, and macrophages. These are specialized cells that live everywhere in the body, ready to go, constantly surveying, looking for injury, okay? Looking for those smoke signals that might be out there. Now, inflammation, as I talked about in, in a very introductory lecture, is it's a surface phenomenon. We're talking about cell-cell interaction, cell-bacteria interaction, cell-blood vessel interaction. And so if I'm thinking about surface interactions, I'm oftentimes thinking about receptors. I need to be able to recognize those injurious agents through receptors, okay? Now, there's also circulating proteins that's downstream in the complement system, we'll talk about that in subsequent lectures. So let's look at receptors, kind of two broad categories. I either have PAMPs, pathogen-associated molecular patterns. These are gonna recognize actual bacteria, actual virus. Or I might have DAMPs, damage-associated molecular patterns. Those are recognizing, uh, if I've got a cell that got hurt, it's gonna send out a signal, hey, I need help, okay? So DAMPs and PAMPs are my two broad ways that I'm gonna recognize something's wrong, we need to bring in reinforcements, okay? Those are those smoke signals that the, the sentinel cells were surveying. So let's bring in leukocytes, let's bring in white blood cells to that area of injury so we can start fighting that fire. So I really, uh, I know this is kind of complex, we're just gonna break it down, but this is essentially how we're gonna get a white blood cell out of the vessel and to the site of injury. So I've got my vessel here, vessel lining here, and I need to get this cell down and out to the site of injury. And so I, this is how my brain works, but I like to use the example of an aircraft carrier. If I've got my fighter jet neutrophil or my fighter jet white blood cell kind of coming in for a landing, it needs to make contact with that blood vessel wall so that it can then get out to the site of injury, okay? So let's break this down a little bit. We've got margination, rolling, and adhesion. And these are my big steps of landing onto that aircraft carrier, essentially, okay? I need to migrate across the blood vessel wall and then into that site of injury like we talked about. So let's start with margination. This is a kind of, if I'm looking at a blood vessel kind of end on, the fastest area of flow is gonna be in the center, axial flow because friction is gonna slow everything down along the, the edge, okay? So I've got my, my leukocytes, my white blood cells flowing through the middle, zooming along. And the example I like here, I had to include this picture, it's the Poudre River in Colorado. But if you think about, if I've got a, a piece of driftwood kind of zooming along the center, it's going pretty fast. Now if I widen that river a little bit, I may have that piece of driftwood slow down and approach the shoreline, and that's similar to what's happening with those white blood cells, okay? Uh, similarly, if we think about, if I need to get something from the middle over to the side, they can slow down and then fight, let's say I've got a fire here. So that's kind of what we're wanting here. So when I say margination, we're getting to the side, the edge of that vessel, we're getting to the shoreline of that river. Now we're gonna start kind of bumping along the surface until we come to a complete stop. And so rolling, in this case, we're going to just loosely adhere, bump off, attach, bump, and then slowly start firmly attaching. So the adhesion molecules that we're really um, focusing on right here are called selectants, and I'm gonna show you a picture of that. But these are low affinity binding. They're not strongly adhered. They're loosely adhered to allow that, that white blood cell to come off and then land back again. And those are just a, a select number of selectants. So if I look at this picture, note that I've kind of approached, I've marginated, I'm approaching that, that aircraft carrier. I've got a predominance of selectants here that's gonna allow my little fighter jet uh, leukocyte to slow down and kind of just roll along the surface, okay? But at some point, we need to get firmly adhered because I've gotta come to a complete stop before I can exit that blood vessel. Okay, and that's where integrins come in. And so integrins to me are like the band that's gonna firmly 
stop that fighter jet as it's coming into that aircraft carrier, okay? Integrins, aptly named, we're gonna integrate between cells, and these are high affinity binding. So I wanted to end on an important clinical relevance because this is a veterinary class and we always wanna see that. Uh, but also this can get kind of nitty gritty and I think it's important to see when things go wrong, what can happen. So again, notice predominance now of integrins, my little yellow nubbins here that are gonna firmly stop that, that white blood cell and then allow it to get to the site of injury. So if your integrins don't work, what can happen? This is not very common, but it's well described aptly named leukocyte adhesion deficiency. I have a deficiency in my ability to firmly adhese to that blood vessel to get those leukocytes out, okay? So I've got a lack of functioning integrins, makes sense. I can roll along all I want, but I can't firmly adhere. And so I may have a, an appropriate number of white blood cells in the blood vessel, they just can't get out, okay? So classic examples in our veterinary species, Holstein cattle, or bovine leukocyte ad adhesion deficiency, or BLAD, uh, and then Irish setters. These are our two that we know have been genetically inherited. So the, uh, they are rare conditions, but it's important to note that if I have this, I would expect recurrent infections. We should be able to fight something pretty easy, but in this case, those white blood cells can't get out of the vessel. I can't fight an infection. And so as a pathologist, I like to include histology, which is looking at tissues under the microscope. And in this case, if I'm looking at a blood vessel, this is all blood, here's my vessel lining. All of these cells along the edge are white blood cells that cannot get out. They're doing their best, but they can't firmly adhere and get out of that blood vessel. So that's why we can potentially see recurrent infections in animals that have leukocyte adhesion deficiencies. Again, not common, but it's something to think about, have on your differential list, if that presents to you in the clinic. So I always like to do a, a check-in, and I'm dating myself when I include my little Bill Nye picture, um, but check in with what we've covered, okay? So if I think about the three types of sentinel cells that are out there kind of surveying the land, my big three are mast cells, dendritic cells, and macrophages. And then the two broad molecular patterns that are recognized by those sentinel cells are PAMPs and DAMPs, okay? So I'm either looking for pathogens or some sort of cell damage, okay? 